I'm going to take you through an example from Linear Algebra with Applications by Otto Brecher, uh, where we look at something called a dynamical system and we analyze its long-term behavior. Here's the setup. We have coyotes and we have rabbits and they're living together in one uh, particular area. Now, the coyotes eat the rabbits. That is their food. And let's assume it's our only food, which is, of course, not accurate, but let's let's go with it. But the rabbits are just fine without the, without the coyotes, though. They will thrive on their own if there's no, no coyotes around. Uh, let's see if we can write down some kind of reasonable equations to express what happens to their populations. Um, so the populations, let's give them some numbers here, CN and RN. Let's let those be the populations in year N. And, you know, we'll start at year 0 and go to year 1, 2, 3, and so on. And, and the, the question is going to be what happens to these populations. Well, the rapid population might look something like this, that the next year's population might be just uh, a percentage increase based on the current year's population, and that accounts for both the death and the reproduction of the rabbits. But altogether, there's a, what I guess, there's a 14% net increase in the rabbit population year to year. Uh, and that, that, as you know, would be exponential growth. But if there's a lot of coyotes, though, that's not good for the rabbits. So let's modify that equation. Let's put this negative contribution to their to their uh, population based on the number of coyotes. So if there's a large coyote population, that negative quantity there is going to be more negative and sub start subtracting off from the population of rabbits. The coyote population will look something like this for our example. Let's say that their population um, declines over time unless there's a lot of rabbits to eat. And if there's a lot of rabbits to eat, that's good for the coyotes. So there's a contribution to their population, next year's population, based on however, however many uh, rabbits there are. So here's our two equations, the CN plus 1 and the RN plus 1. Next year's populations are based on the current year's populations in this linear way. Now we could ask, of course, if a linear model is accurate for real life, and the answer is probably no. Real populations probably behave in a more complicated way, but let's just go with it. Let's explore what happens with this system here. Um, we can break that down into more of a linear algebra looking expression by saying that the vector CN plus 1, RN plus 1 is equal to this matrix times the uh, previous year's populations. And uh, again, we're getting the idea that this year's populations is, tells me what next year's populations are going to be. And we call this a discrete dynamical system. A discrete dynamical system is one, a, a dynamical system just means we're analyzing, you know, a pair of variables and what happens to them over time. Um, and the word discrete here means that we're not considering what we would call a continuous dynamical system where we would be wondering on kind of a continuous basis, year to year, moment, uh, excuse me, moment to moment, every, every second, what are these populations? We're stepping ahead by a whole number every time. This is this year's population, and then we step ahead by a whole year to get, to get next year's population. That's what discrete means. Let's call this CN RN vector XN, and that's what we call a state vector for the dynamical system. We can say that at any given moment, the, the uh, dynamical system is in a particular state, and that just means what are these numbers. Um, the matrix A that we had before is the matrix that we multiply the state vector by to get the next state. And then the, the question that we're wondering is, what happens over a long period of time to the coyote and rabbit populations? In other words, what happens to these states if x0 is the initial state of the population? What are the subsequent states year after year, x1, x2, and x3? Uh, a different way we could express that is this way. If I know what x0 is, that initial state, what are these a times x0, a, a times a times x0, and so on? What are these subsequent powers of a multiplied by x0? What happens to them? Well, I have a little application I wrote to explore that. Here it is. Uh, if I click somewhere in the, uh, we have, well, let me tell you the setup here. We have two axes here. We have a coyote axis and I have a rabbit axis. So if I, if I have any point in here, that's a particular state for the system. For example, 200, 200 here represents 200 coyotes and uh, 200 rabbits. But way over here, 800 coyotes and 200 rabbits. Now I wrote this so that if I click somewhere, that'll establish what the x0 is, the initial state of the system. And not only will it plot a point there, it will also show me the subsequent points, what happens after that. So if I click there, 200, 200, let's see what happened to the populations. 
um, those dots are all the x0 and then the a times that and the a times that and so on. We can see we had an initial decline of the coyote population. Uh, but then eventually the coyote population started to increase along with the rabbit population. They kind of are shooting off to infinity here. Uh, if I click over here, you know, a very small number of coyotes but a lot of rabbits then I have growth of the rabbits and the coyotes together. As the rabbit population increases, those coyotes have more to eat. And eventually there's kind of a very similar kind of behavior here. And interestingly, if I just keep clicking around here, I get the same kind of behavior. I get the shooting off to infinity. Well, this one that I just clicked there was interesting because those coyotes were almost dying out there. The population of coyotes declined, 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 but eventually... Uh, they kind of got caught up and uh, had enough rabbits to eat and had their populations increase and again shooting off to infinity. And that seems to be what happens. Now I feel though if I click way over here to the right, a different thing should happen. If I have a thousand coyotes but only 200 rabbits, I feel like those coyotes are going to eat all the rabbits and then they're going to be gone. And in fact, that is what happens here according to the system that we have. The large number of coyotes caused the rabbit population to go down to zero. Of course, we're not plotting in a negative range here. And does that really make any sense? Well, no, not for rabbits and coyotes it doesn't. But we have the negative numbers here. We may as well just wonder what happens for these places as well. Um, just as an interesting linear algebra question, even if it doesn't have anything to do with rabbits and coyotes anymore. But of course, if I do think of the coyotes and rabbits, that when we start off with these states here, the rabbit population goes down to zero because the coyotes ate all of them. And then what would happen, of course, to the coyotes is they would die out. They have nothing left to eat. But as a linear algebra question, now we have a kind of an interesting looking picture here. Depending on where I click, I, we get different behaviors for what you might call the orbit here. Um, if I take a point, an initial state, and follow all the points that, that uh, are the subsequent states, we call that an orbit. We have an interesting kind of an orbit diagram here. As a matter of fact, I got a little bit carried away with this and I drew a picture of 1,500 orbits of the, under this system here. I removed the axes, I put it on a black background with white dots just because I thought it looked cool. And uh, we can see this strong trend to move upwards here. Uh, depending, of course, on where I click exactly, we have the strong trend to move upwards towards infinity unless there seems to be some kind of threshold here that if I cross over it, large number of coyotes, not very many rabbits, then the populations decline. Um, and so we have a very uh, interesting picture here, and I'm wondering what are these lines here? We can see lines in it, right? There's a line here, and there's a line here. What are those exactly? Well, we can analyze this system to find out. Let me start with this very particular vector here. It's a well-chosen vector, and it's 100, 300, 100 coyotes and 300 rabbits. And I say it's well-chosen because an interesting thing happens. If you multiply it by A on the left, uh, then you get 110 coyotes and 330 rabbits, which is exactly 1.1 times that initial state x0. Now, that's not going to happen with every initial state, but for, for this very particular initial state x0, Multiplying by a just returned a scalar multiple of it. Um, a times x0 is just 1.1 times x0. And so we would call x0 an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1.1 for this matrix A. And an eigenvector uh, initial state is easy to keep track of here because if I multiply it by a again, I'm just going to put another 1.1 on there because of the linearity. And subsequent multiplications by a again and again and again are just going to have a 1.1 raised to the nth power in front of that x0. And that's indeed what we call exponential growth. Both the coyotes and the rabbits would experience exponential growth. Meanwhile, I have another choice here of initial populations, 200 and 100. Now I have to say these were in advance chosen very particularly to work out nicely. That population also is uh, that state, I should say, is also an eigenvector. If I multiply it on the left by a, I get 0 0.9 times x0. 
And what's kind of important about that eigenvalue 0 0.9 is that that is less than 1. So if I repeatedly multiply by a again and again, the 0 0.9 raised to larger and larger powers there is going to go down to 0. So if I'm a little bit past, uh, excuse me, if I start off with 200 rabbits, excuse me, 200 coyotes and 100 rabbits, the general trend over time is that both populations are going to go down to 0 exponential decay I guess is what we would call that right okay so let's call the b1 and b2 vectors those very two those very nice vectors that I had in the previous slides what's important about those vectors is that they are eigenvectors uh, with eigenvalues 1.1 and 0 0.9 respectively and uh, they are independent of each other so they in fact form a basis for r2 R2 has a basis of eigenvectors for this matrix A. Now because B1 and B2, these, these eigenvectors, are in fact a basis for R2, that means any other state, no matter what state I start with, we'll call it X0, it's a linear combination of B1 and B2 by some scalars C1 and C2. And then it becomes a nice way of keeping track of what happens to this population uh, over time if I express that X0 as a uh, express in terms of that basis of eigenvectors because if I multiply by a um, I can just distribute the a over that by linearity and I get this I just get um, multiple uh, we can see exactly how the components of b1 and b2 change and subsequent powers a n times x0 are going to work out to be uh, this linear combination of b1 and b2 uh, so What's interesting about that is that the 0 0.9 part of this is going to go down to 0. The B2 contribution goes to 0. So this, in the long run, does not really make a difference in terms of what happens to these populations. It's really only the B1 component that makes a difference. It's this C1. It's this coordinate here. If that's a positive number, then regardless of what C2 is, this is going to go down to 0. But if this C1 is a positive number, we're going to see that the populations are going to grow exponentially. Uh, but if the C1 is a negative number, which is indeed possible, uh, even if we have positive populations, we could still have a negative coordinate based on this basis, then what we're going to have here is a negative contribution to the population over time. And I think we'll see declining populations. So I have another application here to explore that now. Um, Let's say that I uh, have a dot here. The orange vector shows me the B1 component. The blue vector shows me the B2 component. And as we agreed, the B2 is not going to be the most important part of this. It's really the B1 part. Um, so if I click here, uh, or here, or here, or here, I'm always clicking in a place where the orange vector is positive. But if I go over to here, the orange part of that is negative now. It's pointing in the opposite. This is the orange vector should go this way. Um, we have a negative C1 value here. And so we indeed see the, the decrease of the population based on the C1 value, which is negative. And so we can see that's where this threshold is. The threshold compare, comparing, um, which separates the declining populations from the eventually exponential, expo exponentially growing populations is based on whether the orange vector there is negative or positive. We could also ponder what happens to these places over here based on coordinates, and I'll let you think about that. But um, I think we kind of have our answer now. When we looked at that orbit picture with all those orbits drawn all over the place, we could see this strong line here. In the long run, the B1 component goes down to zero, and we really are only taking multiples of the uh, B, excuse me, the B2 component goes down to zero, and it's really the B1 that we're moving up along. Uh, the vectors get closer and closer to B1, uh, scalar multiples of that. And that's kind of analysis. So the, the, the moral of the story here is that eigenvectors are kind of a helpful way of understanding a, uh, uh, a linear transformation. And um, the next question would be, well, how do I find eigenvectors? I just kind of supplied them in this example. I wrote them down and said, here, these are eigenvectors. But the next question is, how do you find them? And that's a good question for another time.